to the tax session. Uh, as you know, in the agenda, there are two plenary sessions. Uh, one plenary session was held in the morning. Uh, uh, the from, uh, and in the plenary session number two, uh, and a very, very important session of our agenda, uh, we are going to have uh, Professor Lian Vinh, uh, Acting General Director of NIS, uh, will be uh, the moderator of uh, the sessions. And I will uh, introduce uh, Professor Lian from University of Nigeria. So now the floor is yours, Professor Lenvin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lin. And uh, good morning, Professor Paul Ernest. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure for, for me to uh, uh, chair this uh, session or the plenary session by Professor Paul Ernest uh, from the University of Exeter. Uh, so before the presentation by Professor Paul, let me briefly introduce about, about him. So Professor Paul uh, got a PhD in philosophy of mathematics from the London University, and he was appointed to be the full professor of the philosophy of mathematics education from 1998. And he was first appointed to the University of Exeter from 1984. And since then, he was a visiting research professor at uh, different universities, including the Brunel University of London, Hope University of Liverpool, University of Oslo, Norway. And uh, from 2005, he became the uh, emeritus uh, professor of philosophy of mathematics education. His uh, main research areas is about the reflection of mathematics, Mathematics in education, society, and its philosophy significance. And today, we have the honor to have him as a panelist speaker of the conference. He's talking about the errors and mistakes in mathematics and the social constructivism. Professor Paul Ernest, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, show you, share my PowerPoints of, uh, of my talk. Right. Um, so, well, I was gonna say good morning, but of course it's, it's good afternoon to you. Good morning to me here in, in England. And I wanna talk about errors and mistakes in mathematics and their relationship with social constructivism. But we often think of errors as something trivial and something to be avoided. And I want to offer a different slant. And in my talk, I, in various talks, I use humor and jokes. I like to use visual examples of humor, jokes, cartoons, because they show popular and public misunderstandings, misconceptions, as well as understandings. Um, so I, I like to use humor um, as to make a serious point. Now, let me start with a simple error. A 10-year-old child was asked to divide 100 by 2 and 200 by 2, and he came up with the answer 50,100. And when you look at that, you think, this is very strange. But there's a little bit of analysis, and you realize that if you divide 100 by 2, you get 50. You divide 200 by 2, you get 100. And if you write those answers by to put one after the other you get 5100 which we would read as 50,100 so it's quite an obvious error it's not as crazy as it looks um, and uh, it's just a matter of a little bit more skill in knowing how to record the answers now here's a cartoon how do we view errors in mathematics and in this cartoon you have a teacher the, the boy has written on the board uh, two plus two equals five, which is interestingly, one plus one equals three or something, and two plus two equals five are typically used as obvious errors. Everyone can recognize, because everyone knows two plus two equals four, everyone can recognize two plus two equals five as a basic mathematical error, a kind of falsehood. 
Uh, so here we have this two plus two equals five on the board. The teacher is saying, no, it's four. And the, bo and the boy is singing, I did it my way, which is a, a famous song by Frank Sinatra. And of course, um, within arithmetic, it's not, it's not appropriate to do it my way. You need to do it the right way. So it's an error, but it's an error made fun of. So are errors foolish and ridiculous? And this is a, a early film, a, a slide from an early film, Chumps, uh, Chump at Oxford with Laurel and Hardy. The, you know, these comedians are, well, I would see them in the cinema when I, when I was a child. And in one of them, now here they've got some even crazier um, errors. Two plus two equals seven. Three plus three equals nine. Oh, that's almost right because three times three equals nine. Two plus two. And now they're counting on their fingers. Only idiots make errors. No is the, is the, my central message. No, it's not only errors. It's, it's not only idiots who make errors. We all make errors and errors are necessary. So the question is, do we view mass errors as bad mistakes, always to be avoided, or even view errors as sins? In other words, moral slips, moral wrongdoings. So th there is this dark side of errors. Errors are, viewed, are, are seen as a path to falsehood, to sin, to evil, as something really bad. Errors are seen as something to be feared, to be avoided at all costs. And this is a problematic view. And for some students, uh, you, I can't say world round, but certainly in many countries that I've been to, there is um, mathematics can be frightening for some students. And uh, so here's a cartoon. Uh, when is the test? What is the binomial theorem? Uh, and of course, the cartoon uses there's a very famous painting called The Scream by Edvard Munch, and it uses the same face. Uh, to uh, represent fear and horror. Um, so it's kind of playing with the idea of mathematics can be frightening. And for some, mathematics may even seem dangerous. So here is a person, maybe it's a teacher, who was writing something on the board and, the, and has made an error and the, the, the classroom cracks and the hand of mathematics comes through the board saying, no, 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 wrong again. Well, this is crazy in so many ways because mathematics is not embodied as a giant or a, a huge, powerful figure. But on the other hand, mathematics as an abstract thing is a very powerful thing. And, and if you have the notion that making any mistakes is transgressing the rules of this powerful thing, well, and it's, you know, it's dangerous, especially if it bites back or punches back. Is the teacher, is the teacher angry about errors? Um, this was a puzzle I found in a cereal box uh, some years ago and for a child. And it's, it's a puzzle with four pieces and it's luminous. It glows in the dark. But interestingly enough, you have this possibly angry teacher looking at you, the child, with this uh, a central error, two plus two equals five, which symbolizes falsehood, looking at you a bit angry because you are the child viewing this puzzle and you have made this mistake. But of course it's play because it's not really a teacher. You're not really in the classroom. You haven't really made the mistake, but nonetheless, it's the, the, play, the game itself is playing with fear and with, with error in mathematics. When I was young, which was quite a while ago, we were taught by people like this in uh, mathematics. They didn't have the mortarboard hat, but they had the gowns. They were mostly middle-aged men. And, uh, and here you see the teacher is looking at you and sternly, uh, you might be making a mistake. And if you look at the board, as mathematicians, we see it says x squared minus y squared equals x minus y times x plus y. And then the teacher is asking you, what is x? And we know, as most people may not know that that's an absurdity, but as mathematicians, you know that, that all you have is a, a, a general rule, the, the difference of two squares, and the X can be anything. So it's crazy. Maybe the, uh, I, I think the artist maybe didn't really understand. Um, but anyway, it, it's, a, it's an image of the mathematics teacher as a large, frightening presence looking at you and challenging you in a frightening way. 
And the same image appeared in this article. And it's it talks about student teachers fear that student primary school teachers who were uh, learning to become teachers of primary school children and how they were frightened of error, their terror of error. And these recruits, people who are uh, starting off as primary school teacher uh, training, own up to their own fear of mathematics as children. And this is a, another comic figure of British TV. And he's got, and he's again pointing at various tasks, the top of which is. Uh, <coughs> asked uh, her, her um, in the primary school her, her children to uh, her, the children she was teaching to draw a mathematics teacher and this was one of the images they came up with and in some ways it, it's very similar to those two figures I've shown you of the stern mathematics teacher um, here the child has struggled a little bit with the um, with the is it everything okay can you hear me I heard a, uh, I see a hand raised. Everything okay? Anyway, I'll carry on. Let me know if there's any uh, problem. With you. Yeah, we can all hear you. We are saying that uh, we should mute so that uh, we don't interfere you during your talk. You can, you can okay, hear me? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. So please, okay. let us check with the interpreter. I think it's okay. 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 So anyway, my point here was that although those were old fashioned images, I'll try and slow down a bit, old fashioned images, nonetheless, because of comics and other popular media, young children of, of recently still have images like this of teachers as a frightening, uh, you know, man looking at you. Um, so those kind of uh, social images persist. Not And mathematics is not, as we all know, not just about right and wrong. I like this cartoon because it shows again a man thinking just in terms of right and wrong. But even if it was, and we might philosophically argue about that, even if it was, harsh correction would damage learning, as it can damage learning. So I asked the question, why punish errors? And the answer, part of the, some of the answers are that there's a false idea that errors are due to faulty memory or carelessness, that errors are the fault of the child, that good students avoid them. And I think also that wrong is incorrect, gets confused with wrong equals bad. So you've done something bad if you make a mistake, whereas incorrect is not necessarily bad. It may just be a stage on the way to correctness. And one of my main points is about the effects of these views, that they make students frightened of making mistakes. They want to avoid risk. They can develop negative feelings and attitudes when errors are made, as they inevitably are. We all make mistakes, we all make errors, and they can lead to mass anxiety in some children. There's such a thing as negativity bias. Psychologists have identified it and, it, and what it means is that everybody reacts more strongly to negative feedback, to bad news, than to positive feedback or good news. And one study found that negative feedback is five times more potent than the equivalent positive feedback. So in other words, negative feedback is very, if it is very strong, and if it's given very strongly to a learner, it, it can have a powerful impact on them. I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't correct. I'm just saying when overcorrection or, or it's done harshly, this is problematic. And it can be a cause of negative attitudes to mathematics. These can include a dislike of mathematics, um, students' lack of confidence in their own mathematical abilities, and even in extreme case, maths anxiety, a fear of maths. And such attitudes can lead to, with the students, a lack of persistence in solving mathematical tasks. They may give up too easy. 
the fear of risk taking and that's uh, problem solving and you do have to take risks you have to try heuristics to try different possible routes to solution you have to be creative that's where some a lot of the creativity in maths come in and creativity is difficult if you're frightened of taking risks and indeed for some students it can lead to avoidance of maths where, where possible and the, and and the possible outcome of it is a vicious failure cycle so this failure cycle of mathematics uh, with these three interconnected circular stages or spiral stages first of all if you if a child experiences failure at mathematical tasks and they experience lack of progression lack of progress that can give them poor confidence in mathematics even possible mass anxiety as i'm arguing and this can lead to reduced persistence a mass risk avoidance which then leads to further failure further lack of progression and so you have this downward spiral uh, that that you know these all of these things can trigger a child to try less hard to feel they're no good to con continue failing and it's a vicious downward spiral Uh, we've identified such thing as adverse childhood experiences, which these are now recognized as harmful impacts that can affect someone's whole life. And being repeatedly criticized and humiliated for errors and difficulties in maths could amount to an adverse childhood experience in an extreme case. I have friends, grown up friends, who are still fearful of mathematics from something that happened in their primary school. And I think it's our responsibility as mathematics educators to be aware of this. The results can be a loss of self-esteem and lifelong maths avoidance in and out of school. Now, if you can say to me that doesn't happen in certain countries like Vietnam, then that's marvelous and you've been very successful. But in many countries that I've experienced, there is a minority who suffer from these things and I, and I want to bring them to the fore. But I also want to make some epistemological points about the necessity of errors. But carrying on with uh, an analysis of risk avoidance and uh, psychological basis for for the damage of errors or the if we see errors as bad um, I'm looking here at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and he has this hierarchy where you need to meet your most basic needs first for example uh, you need air food water warmth shelter your body needs those and if you don't if you don't have those met then you can't really attend to any higher needs for example if children are cold and hungry uh, or have, have you know other issues like that they're not going to be able to learn at school but notice that on the second level and hopefully very few of our children maybe none of our children have that where you know but on the second level if, if you've, your bodily needs are met uh, then there's a need for safety to avoid threat to avoid risk or to the possibility of failure. So it's, a, it's quite a basic, not the most basic, but quite a basic need to have safety, to not feel threatened in the classroom. And then on top of that, we move to, you know, once you feel safe, you, can, you need love and acceptance, you can develop self-esteem and self-fulfillment. But in other words, it's quite basic, to, the need for safety to, to not feel threatened. So coming back to errors, my one of my main points is that that claiming that errors are bad is a false belief because learning new ideas always results in errors errors are a natural part of learning in computer programming errors are known to be inevitable and getting rid of them is called debugging you expect errors you write something down you know it's like when i write a letter i expect to correct it as i go along both spelling and grammar fortunately on computers these days all that correction is made easy and built in. You can have spell check and all those things. But we don't expect to do something perfectly right through from the beginning. You expect to, and then, you know, they know that in computing. And we need to be aware of that in schooling too. Learning must allow error making in a supporting atmosphere that encourages their open discussion. There's no shame in making an error. Uh, what would be sad was if you don't learn from your error. So teaching must not demonize errors. Furthermore, in teaching, we must use errors for diagnostic teaching. Uh, there was a program called Assessment for Learning. That, you know, that errors are a great source of information to us as teachers uh, to help us see where students need more 
directed focused support. And lastly, uh, creativity can only flourish, as I've already said, uh, away from risk and threat. So, uh, you know, if children, if students are frightened of making errors, they're not going to be able to be creative or to learn in the best possible way. As I said, diagnostic assessment is essential. Um, it's essential for all learning that one needs to um, see where students' strengths and weaknesses are so you can focus on the weaknesses. On and furthermore, only through, only through correction can knowledge and skills grow. For example, concept boundaries are refined by trial and error. And, and also as teachers, we, you know, error patterns give an insight into how learners construct their own knowledge. For example, I won't have time to give you uh, the opportunity to work through these examples, which came from two different children. But um, in doing these subtractions, there were two students here, they, there were problems in the answers and an analysis showed that in the first case, uh, that there was a systematic error that the child was borrowing or taking, you know, not decomposing correctly. And in the second case, the child had a problem with zero that wasn't realizing that n minus zero were whatever the digit was uh, equals zero so you, you can identify errors in in you know in how children construct their understandings their algorithms and also in uh, non-routine um, problem solving tasks so if children are asked to choose how many ways you can uh, make two flavor ice cream cones these are some answers from children. And if we look at the way they've written out their answers, not just the answer, but they're working, we can say that in each case, there are, there's a good strategy, but there's some flaw in the strategy, for example, a missing part or a misunderstood something. So I have no time to go into those particular ones, but this is using diagnosis of errors to see, you know, find ways of helping the child improve. Now, all this kind of evidence helps us to build up constructivist learning theory. Systematic errors and learner-constructed strategies provide evidence for constructivist learning theory. And uh, one of the key elements of constructivist learning theory from Ernst von Glassesfeld is that knowledge is not passively received, but actively built up by the learner. So errors, incomplete skills, alternative conceptions, learners' own strategies, all show how learners construct their own knowledge. And by the way, learners also construct their own attitudes and beliefs based on their experiences. And that's what I was stressing earlier on, that we don't want to give them context in which they feel necessary to construct negative attitudes. But I'm more uh, an espousal of social constructivism, which takes some of the insights of constructivism, but brings in the social dimension. <coughs> and one of the um, one of the uh, key scholars we draw upon in social constructivism is uh, Vygotsky. So he argues that learners need to be set tasks within their area of potential capability with guidance, the zone of proximal development, Vygotsky called it, or in translation. And learner improvement of our abilities needs guidance and feedback. And of course, sometimes that feedback is based on errors. And, and the way that learners improve based on their interaction with the teacher provides evidence for the social constructivist learning theory. Learner capabilities, and this is based on the, this idea that learner capabilities are shaped by dialogues in which guidance, feedback, and correction by the teacher or a capable other is essential. Unlike in pure constructivism, the teacher or the more knowledgeable others play an essential role in learning. You can't, you can't fully learn on your own. Learn, but also learner attitudes, beliefs, and identities are also shaped by their dialogical interaction and feedback. We're not just talking about skills and knowledge here. All aspects of, uh, of the learner um, are developed out of these interactions. And I've been stressing the, the problem where if there's too much negative or critical feedback, that can be damaging for their attitudes and identities. So feedback is both useful and necessary when learners make errors and need correction and guidance, but it has to be done in a way that is supportive and is seen and, and that the learners, well, I, I won't quite say welcome because, uh, you know, it's always slightly 
problematic dealing with your own errors or can be, but where they realize it's just a stage you have to go through. And my own work has largely been in social constructivism and um, sort of social const constructionism. And, uh, and I want to just briefly make the point that, that uh, mathematical knowledge itself, not just in education, is dialogical and based on social construction within the social practice of make, making mathematics. I, I want to argue that mathematical knowledge overall is produced, shared and corrected to be accepted. And uh, mathematics is socially shaped through interactive dialogue, that this is how mathematics evolves. I'm trying to counter the idealism that sees mathematics as some abstract object beyond humanity and argue that it's social construction of human, uh, human beings that brings mathematics into being and shapes it. But that's a little aside, bringing it back to uh, students' mathematics, I, I think the same pattern works there. Uh, student learning also is based as a dialogical nature within the social practice of schooling. And of course, also the social practice of informal learning. Students engage with mathematical activities or conversations. They participate in conversations with others and the teacher, and they develop and correct their interpretations of concepts, method, methods, problems, solutions, and retry them. I mean, I think this is the way we learn everything, but it's certainly very important in mathematics. And the student knowledge of mathematics and everything is socially shaped through interactive dialogue. And indeed, just an aside, let me mention that assessment, which is so prominent both within the classroom, a, a diagnostic assessment and summative assessment on a larger scale, the whole class, the whole school, the whole country, is, is a formally constituted evaluatory dialogue. That too is a dialogue in a broad sense. So I'm talking about the dialogical nature of teaching that face-to-face, -face, if you like, uh, the teacher offers a math task, the student responds with, a, with an answer, uh, which may be outspoken or it may be written, then the answer is submitted to the teacher who offers feedback and correction, that you've got this back and forth, back and forth, and there must be, you know, I, I've estimated that there are between five and a hundred thousand tasks that students will do in their student career, and each of those will be subject to uh, this dialogical response, feedback, correction, etc. And all pedagogy requires correction. So uh, this is a cartoon again. Here's a policeman, American policeman. That's how they used to look in New York. This is an old cartoon, what, 1976 from the New Yorker magazine. He's telling a, a pedestrian how to get somewhere. The pedestrian's image of it, his interpretation is a little bit jumbled. And then the, he has correction where you get a clearer, um, and I like this because it's a cartoon, it's kind of funny, but also it is actually telling you something deep about the nature of learning, uh, interpretation, telling interpretation and correction. So I've talked about dialogue and let me take it a little further, dialogical interaction. Dialogical interaction, my claim is, is the key mechanism behind individual knowledge growth in learning and social knowledge growth and cultural maintenance. So I'm getting really big now from starting with little errors that a child may make in a moment in the classroom. I'm saying that the dialogical interaction, which involves uh, something being put forward and a response to it, and that's where errors can emerge, is, a, is a, the overall, is a, is a crucial big mechanism for knowledge and all sorts of other things growing. It's necessary for the construction and maintenance of a shared social reality. We all have to be um, corrected in our interpretations of things, starting as a child and throughout our, our adulthood. It's also the basis and for the transmission of ethic, ethics, that uh, uh, we learn how to behave with God to others by our, our interactions, our dialogue with them. It's also the basis for personal and social identity. We are shaped, according to this view, by our interactions and, and my current research is using conversation as dialogue as a, as a theoretical unit for the analysis of all knowing and being. So dialogical interaction is necessary to make us human. 
you know, that through personal, interpersonal correction and guidance, we develop our behavior, our knowledge, we maintain our traditions, we develop ethics, our, and then more personally, our sense of self-worth, our personal identity, all these things I'm claiming. But coming back to errors and my initial point, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we must avoid fear. We don't want to correct in a heavy handed way uh, that that leads to the fear. And I thought this was a nice image of, of a, a, a young woman with some in her mind, ghostly figure haunting her. So we must avoid the fear of risk, the fear of risk taking, the fear of uh, fear of failure, fear of reprimand and punishment. Well, obviously we want a little bit, but we don't want it to be paralyzing. We don't want it to damage people. So what we need is supportive correction. On the left side, errors to be treated positively. Um, so you want children, you know, I saw a wonderful lesson uh, in China uh, two years ago where, the, where the, the teacher had the children come up and show their ways of solving a problem. And it started off, she'd chosen the, she, the children who were making the simplest mistakes and it, they showed their mistakes and other children corrected them. I'm sure you do similar things in, in Vietnam. And, and it was all done in an unthreatening, in a, in, uh, errors were treated positively as, a, as something to be shared, something to be overcome together. Errors should not be treated negatively, and I want to say no to fear, and uh, um, yes to acceptance of errors in a nice way, and no to fear. So I pulled together some of the images I showed you before. I think images tell you a lot. So um, errors should not be feared. We want to develop uh, positive beliefs. Errors cannot be avoided. They're necessary in all learning. I'm not saying we encourage errors, Although sometimes you can, in certain kinds of diagnostic teaching, you might set a task where there are certain common errors that children will make that you're aware of, and then you can help them correct that because uh, uh, that can be an efficient way, knowing that there are epistemological obstacles, that there are so many, I mean, I've been looking at zero. There are so many, we saw one of the examples earlier involved misunderstanding zero. Um, you, you know, we can anticipate some of the problems that will arise with certain parts of mathematics. Uh, multiplication of fractions you know that that makes things smaller uh, uh, for um, fractions less than one whereas children often think that multiplication makes things larger so we can anticipate some of the misconceptions and errors that may come about we can even um, plan for them to help as learning experiences so we must acknowledge that errors cannot be avoided or necessary in all learning and the best and the most knowledgeable take the most risks and therefore make the most errors and that's to be applauded confidence is the willingness to take risks and make mistakes and creativity can only flourish when risks and errors are encouraged if if you're looking if you're worrying all the time about getting everything right then you can't be creative you can't you know you can't try out different strategies we need to try and eliminate false beliefs that errors are bad errors are not just bad and maths is not just about right and wrong all knowledge advances through test and improve or trial and error. Even, you know, one of the most celebrated results in, in mathematics in the last 30 years, Andrew Wiles got his proof of Fermat's last theorem wrong and then corrected it after a further year and is lauded as, a, as a, you know, one of the great mathematicians of our era. When you look at sports people, you don't say, oh, that sports person tried for that record and failed. You look at their best successes not their not their weaknesses not their worst you know it doesn't matter how many times you failed a long a high jump if you did clear two meters or whatever the record might be um you measure them by their best not by their weak you know by the by the errors or mistakes and we we got to see uh, errors as necessary and something that we work with and not not demonize maths attitudes and confidence are things we want to develop Good attitudes are essential and sometimes underestimated. And attitudes are part of the whole person. The whole person involves intellect and feelings. And effective maths knowledge will mean that we feel we are not frightened to make mistakes and that we want students to have, be confident and be, so they can be persistent and willing to accept challenges. And I showed you a, um, a failure cycle, and this is the positive version 
Um, so it's nice to be able to switch from a negative view to a positive one. That that this is, I think, where where really good students go. Where you know when things go well, you're enhanced, you improve. So if you have success at mathematical tasks and mathematics overall, it increases your mathematical confidence, your pleasure, your motivation, your sense of self-efficacy. Then you make a little bit more effort. You persist a bit longer. You're happy to try more demanding tasks. Your success goes up. You, uh, you, 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 you then, you know, and you've got this virtuous upward going spiral. So um, how you view your, your attitudes, help your persistence lead to success. And you have this upward spiral, which is the, the opposite of the downward spiral I showed you before. And I think this, uh, this is really important. We've probably all experienced this where things go well and it gives you confidence, you carry on. Building success, the, the success cycle is intrinsic. We're not seeking success for outside things. It's the, you know, it, it's the pleasure of success and self-enhancement that those are self-motivations. And, and I want to argue that we can turn the failure cycle into a success cycle by subtracting risk and making success achievable. And we're sharing errors without fear or threat. And I think this can lead to positive attitudes. And I think at school, we need to reduce the, the dominance of exams and improve the quality of stu the student learning experience with more choice, allowing for more interest, effort and success in whatever ways we think are, can work. So children should see the math classroom as open, active and creative, where risk taking is encouraged. This is a child's picture of a mathematics classroom. All these things are going on. The children are active. It's not very, uh, it's, it's elementary mathematics, but they look happy and it says things that maths is fun. They see maths in the world and in the classroom and it's something positive and active and creative. Um, not like in the left-hand picture where we see, uh, you know, through a closed classroom, the children are sitting passively and the teacher is just lecturing them. Yes, there is a role for that, but, uh, you, you, but we need some activity as well. So uh, to, we shouldn't only be focusing on right ans answers, but uh, of course, teacher guidance and formative assessment are always essential. And that's the end, thank you. Paul Ernest, uh, for the very inspiring presentation that encouraged the student to face things with the error and mistake, not fearing them. And sometimes for, for the math, uh, lesson, we we think math lesson is right or wrong, and only the right answer counts. So somehow, I mean, in the teaching and learning, both the teachers and the students are feelings of I mean making error and mistake, and it makes I mean things. Uh, it, it like I mean the students become more and more they don't want to leave out from the comfort zone. So I mean, thank you very much for for, for the presentation. So now we open for the question from the participants. So if you have any question for, for the speaker, please put on the Q&A and then we will uh, transfer it to, to Professor Ernest. Yeah. So while we are waiting for, for the question, can I just give a, a, one more comment uh, about the presentation? Because I, I remember one of the cartoon, the picture that you saw when two plus two equal to five and the students uh, become angry and the teachers also angry. And then they, the, the, the student decides, okay, I did it my way. So it, it seems like I'm asking the question, what is the reaction of the teacher when the student make a mistake? So sometimes I mean, the, the, the simple reaction is the teacher will only follow to the correct answer. For example, like the, when the teacher asking, what is two plus two equal? And most of the students will answer is equal to four and few students will answer equal to five. And the teacher will be happy because there's some, some people answering is equal to four already. And they just, I mean, ignoring or skipping for the wrong answer. The second and one, you see, in, yeah. in that context, a teacher could then, uh, and you see, the thing is, it's a silly example because two plus two equals five, we know is elementary, but let's stick with that example if that was yes. the case, right? <laughs> then the teacher could, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, yeah. could find another mode of representation and say, take 
two pieces of chalk or two books and two books and say, do you agree that that's two books and that's two books? And then you put them together and you say, right, I put them together, which is I've added the two sets, if you like. And how many do we have now? So in other words, th that's part of the teacher's pedagogical knowledge mm -hmm. to have access to different representations so you can reach an answer, not by authority, of course, but by yes. some form of reasoning, and it might be inductive reasoning or yes. using examples. But uh, you know, it, so we want to teach mathematics as a subject of reasoning. Yes, yeah. So and I mean, I cannot agree more. I mean, when you say that, we can consider the mistake is incorrect. It's not the bad thing, and it is the path to the right answer. And I, I think there's some uh, someone raised his hand to ask a question, Professor Wenji Tang. So, uh, Professor Tang, can you admit yourself and ask him a question? Yes. Yes, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Wing. Uh, hello, uh, Professor. Yeah, uh, yeah for Ernest, yes. It is my big, um, it is a big uh, pleasure to meet you, uh, even over virtually here, because I have uh, read a uh, short book, very interesting, about the mathematical uh, philosophy. Uh, hmm. Yes, I have learned so much, so much from your presentation uh, about two things. The first, I think, the, as we are educator and also mathematics teacher, so our had uh, attitude, you know, for students is that we have to encourage them to learn. So I think when they do mistake or error, I think they so they uh, volunteer to learn something. So I think. In this case, even when they do mistake, we have to encourage them and to give a compliment, etc. So I think it's a very as a good um, attitude from the, the teacher. And the second thing I would like to ask, because uh, we even in your presentation you you use two words: the error and mistake. You know, the error and mistake. And um, could you explain more the different, or you use that, but it's the same level, or it's different? For me, a little bit uh, different, the two word error or mistake. For example, when we students learn a new concept, a mathematical concept, for example, the concept of vector, you know, the vector. In this case, I think they should do some mistake when they confuse uh, the, a vector with a sermon, you know, for example. So they should do a mistake. Uh, and another thing, when they learn about the operation with the decimal number, you know, I think in this case, or compare the decimal number, they should uh, produce some mistake when they compare two decimal uh, with the different, you know, uh, because in this case, they apply the, the old knowledge, uh, mathematical knowledge with the whole number. So in this case, mm -hmm. it is a, I, I call logical mistake, but it's so that student learn something. And now this uh, learn uh, knowledge, could not apply in the new situation, but it's uh, necessary for uh, learning new things. So could you explain uh, more about that and how we do can qualify this kind of mistake? This is a uh, epistemology mistake or it is a calculation mistake. Uh, thank you very yes. much. Yes, uh, yes. Well, I have to admit, I was using mistake and, and <coughs> mistake and error as synonymous. I wasn't distinguishing between mistake and error, but there is a distinction between mistake, error, and misconception. Yes. Mm -hmm. When when you develop something, uh, there may be some slight element wrong in or, or not not corresponding with the conventional or intended way of understanding. For example, um, the uh, you know you use the example comparing the size of decimal numbers. That you know if you compare. Um, 1.01 with 0.87, um, a child might say, oh, well, that's not a good one, 0.875, say, they might say the 0.875 number is bigger. Because as you say, they are applying a partial rule, how to compare whole numbers, and they don't realize that the, the, the number of digits in the case of a decimal number is not an indication of its magnitude. That, <clears throat> that you, you can't just count the number of digits to, to estimate the magnitude, the order of magnitude, because the decimal point changes the whole meaning of, uh, <coughs> sorry, 
But so uh, there's errors and mistakes, misconceptions. And, and of course, there's a lot of study of this in science education as well. They're concerned with different ideas of velocity or momentum or other things that can be misconceived, uh, comparing Aristotelian with, with uh, uh, Newtonian or Galilean notions. And they also talk about alternative conception because they don't want to make a judgment. They want to say an alternative conception is you can understand things in a different way. Um, but a misconception has the notion of right and wrong built in already. I'm not so worried about that because we know that there's a conventional body of mathematics that we're trying to build up. And that, um, you know, whatever you say about its origins and how socially constructed it is, we have agreed that, you, you know, rules about that two plus two does equal five. That once you set up a system of arithmetic, it's not, you can't choose what the, the answer will be to two plus two or more complicated things. That one of the things we seek in mathematics in particular is disambiguation, is a uniqueness of answers to uh, you know, an algorithm or a function is ill-defined unless it gives you a unique answer. So, um, I, I, you know, maybe I should be more concerned about the language, but I, I th I'm happy to talk about misconceptions and, under, and hear what the scientists say about alternative conceptions. So, ha sorry, have I missed your point? Uh, that's what I can think of so far. Okay, so thank you, uh, Professor Tang. So we have a few more questions for, for you. Uh, the second question is, what do you think about the point of confidence is one of the most important attitude for the student to develop? Confidence? Yes. Do you think yes. confidence? Absolutely. For me, you know, I've been talking about both negative and positive attitudes. And, you know, I've stressed the negative attitudes and how we have to be careful about forming them. But positive attitudes includes confidence, pleasure, uh, liking, you know, um, willingness to take. So you need confidence to be able to risk taking, you know, taking risks and possibly the risk of making errors. So confidence is so important. Yes, indeed. And 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 if you're not confident, then you you may not exhibit, you, you know, you may not show any misconceptions that you have. You know, you have to be confident enough to show what you think the answers might be, and then you're more liable to learn. So, so uh, yes, I think confidence is, is so important. That's part of the positive uh, the collection of positive attitudes to mathematics that lead to the upward spiral that I was indicating, the you know, you know, success cycle. Yeah, so thank you very much for the answer. And there's an, another question from one of the participants. Uh, he mentioned that the slide 30... You mentioned about the learners' identities, and in your book, the philosophy of mathematics education, you also pose the question: How does the identity of the learner change and develop through learning mathematics? Could you please explain more about the learner identities and how the mistakes and errors in mathematics may contribute to the development of the learner identities? Well, yes. I mean, don't forget that we're corrected. Uh, in, in every, you know, you start off the first thing you're corrected in, well, apart from behavior, the, you know, the mother with the child before language or the caregiver, you know, there are corrections. But when you start learning language, you are rapidly corrected about correct and incorrect uses of language. In English, for example, um, it's very easy to, um, plur, you know, to follow patterns like uh, you know, a mouse, one mouse, two mouses because there's a general rule that you you pluralize by adding an s on the end <laughs> whereas in fact we say two mice so um it's correction that you need to um uh, to, to learn and grow sorry i lost the question yeah so they want to could you please explain more about the learner identities and how the oh yeah 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 so what I, thank you thank you so what i was saying was that we 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 are subject to correction in all dimensions of our self and our interaction and i want to argue that our identities are primarily formed by our relationships and interactions you know in out of school and in school and all these little things add into our identities who mm -hmm. we are what we value how we think of ourselves we in the diagram where i showed all these funny figures uh, oh, connected. We learn our culture, uh, you know, through interaction and, and um, 
uh, dialogue and and um, there's a, a necessary part of dialogue is negative correction you know correction um, so so you know it, identity I mean you can talk about identity in, as a mathematics learner identity as a mathematics teacher I, but there's also identity as a person identity as a citizen and all these things well we may have multiple identities but I do think they're all part of a whole and so that uh, I mean I, I, I have another um, idea which is that um, uh, if you can experience success in anything you study in school, it will enhance your identity. So supposing you're not very good at mathematics, but are good at sport, or supposing you're good at mathematics and not very good at sport, that thing that you're good at, that gives you a sense of confidence and achievement and helps you uh, strengthen your identity. So I think everyone needs to have at least one dimension. We often focus too much on mathematics. And, real, and we should realize that students are whole beings. And if they can have success in any one thing, then that I think can help and enhance them as an overall being. We focus on mathematics and that's where we particularly want them to build their strengths. <clears throat> but uh, I think we need to see it, have a bigger picture. The student's overall identity is something bigger than just what we experience and work with in our classrooms. Yeah, so thank you for, for the explanation. And another question from the participant, Ayuen. She asked you about, I mean, so the math teachers in the classroom are seen I mean, kind of the authority. And however, it seems to take time to have all of the teachers' agreements on forms and the belief and how the teachers can encourage the mistake and the error in the classroom. What sort of strategies could you advise for the, for the teachers? I mean, for the teacher training, how to make them uh, understand the, the, the student, how can them I mean, spend time to encourage the student to, I mean, not fearing the mistake? Well, I think one way, and I was describing an example I saw in China, I've, I've been to Vietnam and, and uh, had a wonderful experience, but I'm afraid I didn't go into any, any classrooms and see what was, you know, any examples of your practices. I was there as a tourist and I had a wonderful time. But uh, the example I saw in China was in a, pra in a demonstration lesson <clears throat> where the, the teacher set a task and it was something like, it was probably, you know, age nine year old children. And it was something like, you know, a, um, uh, a bus is traveling in town and uh, five people get on. And, or there were, the, the, you know, there were seven to start with five get on and, and uh, or no, no. Anyway, it was some example where five people get on a bus and then three get off at the next stop. And then when it arrives at its destination, there are 23 on it. How many were there on it when it started? And then the children were working in their own ways to solve this problem. And she went around and saw the solutions they were doing and the ways they were representing them. And she chose examples of weaker solutions first, uh, incorrect, if you like, and took them and got the child to demonstrate them on the blackboard with, the, with some other children standing nearby. And then other children would say, oh, well, no, no, you, 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 you know, you're, you're not, you're not reversing it. Um, and uh, so in other words, if you can get children to demonstrate their work and, and encourage and praise them for having the courage to come up and show their work, and then the fact that it needs to be corrected by other children is not seen as a weakness, that's very good, because then they're all working together to, to get a correct method. And no one's saying, oh, you're wrong, that was bad, you, you know, there's something wrong with you. No, 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 you need to have a, um, you know, a gentle system where we're taking the risk to show your workings, even, and, and then you can praise them and say, thank you. You know, it's great that you showed us and it was a good model. Uh, there's some little bit of it that didn't work and we're, you know, we're improving on that. Yeah. So that's one way. Another way is that student uh, teacher pedagogical knowledge ideally should include awareness of common uh, common uh, errors that there, as we were hearing about decimal points, there are, you know, maybe 50 um, sticking points in, in school mathematics. I, I made that up. It might be 20, it might be 120. But, you know, there are, so, you know, like, like I said, the role of zero is one of them. Uh, multiplication, there are things with fractions. There are some well-known errors, problem, uh, conceptual obstacles. Uh, and that if a teacher is aware of those, then, then 
maybe even encourage errors because some children will, will be carrying some of those uh, misconceptions. And then if it can be discussed out uh, in, in, the, in front of the whole class, it can help not only correct the child who's made the error, but also all the others who might be carrying it as well, because it's natural. Those epistemological obstacles are natural uh, sticking points as you progress in your knowledge because meanings change don't they you know addition is different for whole numbers for for rationals for for uh, integers for you know all the different numbers uh, meaning is different uh, same with all the other operations so we you know we often forget that we're changing the rules as the children go along and no wonder they get stuck first we tell them you can't take three from two and then we say three from two is minus one yeah. So thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. I don't know if any uh, participant want to ask Professor Ernest uh, directly, or I can read from the list of the question uh, in, front of, uh, in front of me. Okay. So uh, Professor Ernest, we have the the last question in, in this session. So you know, it's sometimes we we know that the mistake and the errors may have a bad impact for the student, for the kids, as you mentioned in, in, in the presentation, when the student are fearing of the error and the mistake, they are not have a confidence to learn mathematics and sometimes they will give up mathematics for the, for the further study. So in some of the school, it will become in, the, in another end of the extremes, when the teachers giving the high grade for the student easily, they only giving the easy task so all of the students can get the, I mean, the good results. And without any mistake, without any uh, any errors, getting a very high grade, but the student are afraid of getting out of the comfort zone. And in the long term, they still can I mean, go further. And when they see some challenging uh, tasks or challenging problems, they cannot I mean, go outside of their comfort zone and try the new thing. So do you have any comment on that? Or what is the advice on, on, on this space? And it's, yes, and, yes, and that can be a symptom of well, a lack of confidence that that, that students um, ha, have been used to a certain kind of element. That you know, I talked about Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. That students are learning when they're properly in that zone, they're uh, working on tasks that they they need a more knowledgeable other to guide them. It's not something they can do easily already, then they wouldn't be learning. But if they're, in a, if they're doing tasks they need a little bit of guidance for and they make mistakes, that means they're at the cutting edge of their knowledge and so that they are going forward. So you're saying if you're in a classroom where they're only being given tasks that, involve, that they don't make mistakes at because it's all too easy. And I remember when I was a school teacher myself a long time ago, I had some low attaining classes who would quite like adding matrices because adding matrices, it looks like you're doing complicated mathematics, but it's very easy because all you do is identify the, the, the numbers in the same you know, column and row and add them together and put them in the same column and row. And that's a, that's a trivial task for a, for a 14 or 15 year old. But if you lack confidence, you feel you're doing some proper mathematics. And so they quite liked that. They were sticking with something that was easy, but it wasn't taking their learning further. You do need challenge. You do need risk. You need to be pushing forward always. And that, um, that upward virtuous cycle I talked about involved taking risks, taking on more demanding tasks and persisting on them. And, and only that way, and then having success at those, feeling good about it, and then taking even more demanding tasks and going up only through that upward spiral, are you developing your knowledge capability and hopefully your confidence? Yeah, so thank you very much for the answers. And I think the answer is the great way for us to closing this section. Uh, I'm pretty sure that for teaching mathematics, we should not put a high barrier so the student will have the confidence to grow. But the limitation for the student, there's no limitation. We should encourage the student to try on the difficult task, try for the challenging things so they can grow in, in the mathematical learnings. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Paul Ernest, for joining us in this conference. We all enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Polanos. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lenvik. Uh, we uh, have listened to one of